four, three. All right. Thanks for being with us today, Billy. Glad to be here. Appreciate it. So you were you were a, a, a reporter for the Ledger Inquirer for a number of years. How long were you with the the paper? Oh gosh, now that you're trying me. I was <laughs> editorial page editor for about 15 years, and I think I was there three years or four years before that as senior writer for the paper. And you covered a lot of civil rights issues with the paper. Uh, I I mainly covered civil rights in the in the 1960s for the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Mm. That was my chosen beat, uh, although many other people covered civil rights too at the paper, so I was just one of a number. Uh, but when I got to Columbus, I was determined to try to get as much racial material in the paper as I could. In fact, that's one reason I came here. And so we did, uh, on the editorial page particularly, um, we, we ran what were really uh, news articles and feature articles uh, just so we could get some of these stories that we knew in the in the paper. Dusty Nix, who was uh, was instrumental in, in getting the paper to do that, and uh, he's now the editorial page editor. And so we could run long series on racial matters uh, mm -hmm. w when we could develop the material. Was there resistance in the paper or in the community for these kinds of stories? Yes, although it, it's you can't just make it a broad and general thing. Some uh, members of the staff uh, didn't like it at all. Um, uh, others did and welcomed it. So it, it, the Ledger Inquirer then had many, many more employees than it does today. So it was a large, mid-sized metropolitan daily uh, with a circulation in the 70,000 70, and upwards, particularly on Sunday. Uh, and so um, most of the reporters, particularly the young reporters, were supportive. Some of the older employees uh, would come up and threaten you. I was threatened to have my family, my wife and children, burned to death if I kept it up. And um, I mean, you you get that everywhere you go. It's not unique to the Ledger Inquirer. You also got that in the Journal Constitution, where the people in the press room would often set Martin Luther King's name upside down, or misspell it, or misspell your name, or otherwise express their disapproval. Hmm. But the community. Um, was still stuck in um, the 1950s as far as racial matters were concerned, at least in my opinion, uh, and had a lot of stuff to work through. And wh why did you decide to write this? Because you wrote a great three um, article series on the life and death of, of Thomas Brewer what, in 1988. Why did you decide to focus on him? Well, Lord, uh, Dr. Brewer was, my daddy did, uh, who was a physician here, um, and uh, Dr. Cyril Floyd in Alabama, his partner, did diagnoses for Dr. Brewer. In those days, doctors worked alone and usually in one man or two man offices, but they still helped each other, so there's kind of a floating clinic. And Dr. Bre Dr. Brewer was an excellent surgeon and very good at delivering babies, not so hot at, uh, at diagnoses, so he asked daddy and, and um, Sarah Floyd to help him with that, and they would, and uh, so I, there was that background, and so although I was too young, to, my father died in 1951, to remember what Doc, Daddy said about Dr. Brewer, I'm sure it, it was, they were very kind remarks, because he liked him. Uh, and then, I'll tell you the truth, I was looking for uh, a basketball game, Columbus High School versus, I think it was Central. And because that night I had scored 25 points when I was in high school, and I found I went back in the paper and I found uh, the story, and there on the front page of the paper was the account of Dr. Brewer's murder. So it came out of uh, misguided egotism, I think you could say. <laughs> and um, so, who was Dr. Brewer? Very interesting guy. Um, First of all, he was a complete man. He was not cowed by the whites in town. Uh, he was not afraid. Uh, all of his friends testified to that. Um, he was, uh, he had a lot of faults and a lot of virtues. Um, he, was a, he was brusque, abrupt. A lot of black people didn't like him. 
He was one of these kind of guys who would invade your body space when he wanted to talk to you. There's a well-known physician in Columbus now who does the same thing, comes right up to you and does everything but grab the lapel of your coat, you know, and talks right in your face. Brewer did that any time he wanted to make a point. Um, but his virtues so far outweighed um, his faults that uh, he, he was dedicated. Uh, he came from Saco, Alabama, down in South Alabama, went to Meharry in Nashville, got his medical degree, went in the Army, came here in 1920, the same year my daddy came here, and that may have something to do with their friendship, I don't know. But uh, set up practice and developed a big, big successful practice by 1930. And by 1930, he was the leader of the uh, local black community. Uh, he was a force in education in the community. Uh, he worked to integrate the police department. He worked for public spaces uh, so that blacks could uh, go to parks and, and, and go to swimming pools. He did all sorts of things. And I tell the young people when I talk to them today about um, Dr. Brewer and wh what the situation was when he first came here, uh, black people couldn't uh, be born in the same hospital as whites. You couldn't be, they couldn't be buried in the same cemeteries. They couldn't eat in the same restaurants. Um, they couldn't go to the same doctors. They couldn't sit in the same waiting rooms. They could not drink from the same water fountains. They could not ride on the same parts of buses. I think black people today and white people have forgotten just how rigid apartheid was in, in this part of the world and particularly in Columbus. Um, and to answer your question of why I got interested in this, when I was with the Journal Constitution I did a series, statewide series on racism in the larger um, mid-sized towns in the state, Augusta, Macon, Columbus, I think I did Albany, Savannah, et cetera. And I went in and interviewed the uh, black people in those communities and asked them how the situation, racial situation was. This would have been about 1965. Uh, and they all listed Columbus as the worst place. Um, I remember interviewing George Ford and A.J. McClung. I, I don't know whether I interviewed Frank Chester then, but I did later. Uh, and they just represented um, the situation here is appalling. And um, that, that stirred my interest. And um, Brewer grew up uh, as a mature man uh, from the 1920s to say the 1950s when he became more celebrated, better known among whites to whites, uh, in that. And, and it, you can imagine a man of his talents and his intellect and his general level of the energy. He was a well-known Republican, member of the Republican Party. He was on the state party um, committee. He was known in Washington. He had connections everywhere uh, in national and state politics. And yet in Columbus, he was, they, people tried to treat him as a little boy uh, or as worse. Um, of course, that didn't always work with Brewer. They found out right quick. Um, and so he was, um, he was roundly hated by uh, many whites in Columbus. He was not liked by all blacks. A lot, a lot of blacks considered him too pushy, too forward, didn't like him personally. But most of them uh, came to see his good side. And in the end, they, in, they called him chief, uh, a term of great affection, by the way. And uh, they came to love him and realized what a resource he was and how much he had done for them. Mm -hmm. And not just in uh, public matters and whether you could ride on the front of the bus or go swim in a white swimming pool, but in, in things that had to do with their livelihood, their families. He was, of course, close to them because he delivered babies and so forth. So he was a man of large parts. What, and you mentioned Columbus was worse than Macon or Savannah or a lot of other communities. What, what do you think made Columbus different from those places or worse than those places in terms of race relations? Our history. Yeah. We lead the nation or we are second in the nation in uh, violent crimes against blacks. Um, we, we trail, I think we still trail the uh, Mississippi Delta region, I'm not sure about that. The Chattahoochee River Valley from here down to Bainbridge 
is among the worst places in the world to be black, um, and has been. There are lots of lynchings here, beatings, disappearings. Um, this is this was for many years, and I, even when I grew up here, this was a bad place to be black. Bad place to be black. Yeah. And you. Um... And it comes from that history. Of, the racism goes all the way. I won't go back into the Indian thing, but it goes all the way back to the Indian days. Mm -hmm. And well, you, you mentioned a little, a few of his civil rights activities. Can maybe go into elaborate on a couple of them. You know, before before the Brown versus Board of Education case. Well, of course, the most famous thing was the Primus King case in 1946 that uh, uh, ultimately led to the integration of the Democratic Party um, primary here in Georgia. Brewer was the person who pulled that together and organized it. Uh, and, and although it, we call it the Primus King case, it actually it should be called the Brewer case. What happened was um, and there was a minister of the local church here, that a black church here that Brewer had primed to take the lead in that case when the opportunity came and uh, he was out of town uh, when Brewer uh, felt he could, he could get it started. And uh, Brewer just went by Primus King's barbershop and grabbed it by the collar and said, come on, we gotta go and uh, took him down to the, to the courthouse. And uh, they had to go through several steps in order to be able to file this thing, you know. Um, and uh, that's how it got launched. And he raised the money secretly in Columbus. He and a, a group of about 20 local black people raised the funds. Um, took a long time for them to get uh, enough money to launch into a case of this magnitude. This was a uh, a tremendous thing for for them to have taken on. But they had a citizens committee and this citizens committee uh, helped Brewer raise the money and they they were able to uh, prosecute the case mm -hmm. to a successful conclusion. Nobody thought it was it had a chance to succeed. And, um, uh, but some, for some reason Columbus people didn't seem to hold that case against uh, Brewer so much as they did his later cases. It, I think maybe they had they realized that, uh, that he was trying to get the vote for his people. And, and I think there were some white people who felt that, okay, that was, that's okay. Uh, not so the school integration, which came later, and, and especially not so the golf courses. They, <laughs> for some reason, that, in, that enraged them. I don't know what that was all about, but that was very noticeable in the research I had to do. And he was responsible for Carver Park, too. Yes, he, he early on he uh, he worked hard on parks and public spaces. Uh, he he tried to get swimming pools for blacks. I think he actually got one. Uh, and he worked. One of the reasons he was interested in golf courses uh, is that the old Lions Club course down on uh, South uh, Commons uh, was owned by the city, even though they wanted you to think it was owned by the Lions uh, in order to avoid federal civil rights suits. Um, same deal with the. Flat Rock Park out the road uh, towards mid, uh, mid of and uh, Brewer realized that this was what they were up to, and so part of getting involved with the golf course, I don't think any of the black guys, uh, five of them showed up out there trying to play golf one day, I don't think any of them played golf, and, 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 um, uh, but Brewer, who didn't show up on that one, because he liked to stay behind things, he much play, would like to be in the shadows, because Every time his name got in the newspaper, it was published in the newspaper, it was subject of all sorts of uh, outcries and people objected to what he was doing just because he was Dr. Brewer. Mm -hmm. So he wanted these guys to uh, take the lead and they did. And uh, ultimately uh, they got to play on the golf course, but it took a while. <laughs> and he, he's part of this, uh, seems like there was a, a fairly sizable, thriving black middle class in Columbus. Doctors, yes. uh, the, the undertakers, you know, there was, there was a business community here. You very very large one, and uh, yes, I remember that very yeah. well. Down on First Avenue particularly, but also on Broad and just downtown in general, there would be sections. Uh, the First Avenue section was, was rather uh, commonly mainly blacks walking up and down the streets, going into the clothing stores, including the F&B clothing store we're going to talk about. Um, and uh, also on Broad, a lot of barbers were black, a lot of dentists were black, many black physicians, 
uh, a few black lawyers, very good ones, I might add, Albert Thompson uh, and um, some others. Uh, this, this guy, Hebert, uh was a very excellent lawyer. And, and all of these people, under Brewer's influence, uh, began to coalesce into a, um, an organized group. And in 1939, they applied for a, a second chapter a, uh, for uh, the NAACP here in Columbus. There had been one in 1918. Mm. Uh, Columbus had an NAACP chapter in 1918. And I, I don't know when that one was just sort of petered out, I suppose. It was sometime around World War II or after World War II. But, um, or World War One, I, I think. But anyway, in 1939, they successfully got another charter and had a chapter started here. And after that, Brewer was identified primarily with the NAACP. Well, of course, we've forgotten nowadays how intimately identified uh, the NAACP was with um, integrating the public schools. And, and, and it is true, broadly and generally, that white people not only disapproved of the NAACP in this town, they hated it. Mm -hmm. So much so that if black people were members of the NAACP, they kept it secret from their employees. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I have a, a, a cousin here who had a, a maid um, whom he was very fond of, and in front of her, uh, in front of him, she conducted herself like um, Mrs. Tom. But, um, in private, she was quite different. And I remember going, having dinner at her, at, at Clay, at my, this relative's house, <laughs> and being waited on by uh, this black woman uh, who was his cook. And I was covering the NAACP meeting later that night downtown in the Ralston Hotel, and there she was sitting on the speaker's platform. <laughs> so there, were, there was a lot of that going on. and. Um, also, um, the communism thing came up, you know. You, we went through the, uh, the, the era of calling everybody in Congress um, who was not a, uh, an extreme right-wing uh, person a, a communist. And um, that was also very prevalent here in Georgia. People like uh, the Attorney General Eugene Cook, of course, um, Governor Talmadge and Roy Harris and Augusta, all these people um, belong to that camp, that uh, states' rights or white citizens' council crowd. Uh, and they really were racist, and they were racist to the core. And uh, they meant stop it. Marvin Griffin, unfortunately, a very intelligent man, was a governor in there, and um, he also followed suit. I've always regarded him as a tragic figure because everybody knew he was smart. But uh, it, it, it was um, a mixture always of good people, black and white, decent people, and of people who seemed to have come from almost from a different world who could not be approached on the basis of, uh, well, this is the best thing for all the people or or God forbid the notion that all men are created equal or any of that stuff. They mm -hmm. were just hardball racists. Yeah. And yeah. they killed people here. They killed black people here. Yeah. And you, you mentioned that he's before the Brown versus Board of Education case, which um, ordered the desegregation of uh, public schools across the country. You suggest in that in the in your articles that he um, that he was tolerated, I, I guess maybe is, is a good way to put it. He was yeah. even given an award as Negro C Citizen of the Year. Yes, he was. I think that was in 1951. Um, and he he was a white people knew he was a good doctor, knew that he was tending to his people and that he he did his work. And uh, so uh, and, and other doctors, white doctors, tended to accept him, although. Um, I'm not so sure of the story that he had, um, he was allowed to practice it uh, at uh, City Hospital is really true. I, that may have happened once or something twice, but um, he got along with the other doctors and my daddy and others 
obviously liked it. So uh, there was that part. There was that part of it. It, it really was two things. The 1954 U.S. Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education and more importantly, actually here locally, was the 1954, uh, 1955 Supreme Court ruling uh, that um, the states were going to have to speed up their integration and, and uh, affect it uh, um, with reasonable speed. Mm -hmm. And that, that thing, for some reason, just traumatized the white communities. I mean, th I think they looked on Brown versus Board of Education is a sort of, well, so what? It happened in Washington, and, you know, it's not going to happen here anyway. All the public officials said, no, 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 never, and uh, as Marvin Griffin did, and, and all the rest, and Talmadge. Uh, I heard some things that Talmadge said in the 46th election, and again in 48, when, that uh, would not be played on television. He, say, he would mm -hmm. say them openly in public speeches. But, the 19, but that 1955 ruling by the Supreme Court, for the first time, people took seriously this business of the, you mean, and these people are, are serious and they really intend to integrate our schools. That had just never occurred to anybody here and, or anywhere else in Georgia that I knew. So that got it started and then uh, they followed a, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott, of course, started in 1955 and was running in 1956. Uh, uh, people, for the first time, heard of a, a virtually unknown Baptist preacher, black Baptist preacher named Martin Luther King, Jr. Um, Arthurine Lucy was trying to integrate the University of Alabama, and this, people are still angry about that. I know people are still angry about that. And... Um, Dr. King's home was uh, bombed in Montgomery. Uh, Nixon's home was bombed. Uh, another fellow named Nixon in, in Montgomery was bombed. And so that, all that was going on. And um, then this curious thing uh, I always want to say about buses. I think that buses have been unfortunately ignored as a field of uh, co conflict in uh, race relations in the South, buses were practically the only place that black people and white people were thrown together today uh, in, a, uh, in an environment that did not involve employment, uh, was not, you know, it wasn't a case of, of uh, servitude. Uh, it was, a, it, it, it approximated Equality. I mean, they both got on the bus. They got on at the same time. Uh, they tended to be going to and from work or to and from town, uh, and so it, it it was an it was a place very capable of inflammatory uh, incidents, and it happened many times. Many blacks in Columbus and, and around the South were insulted on bus, buses. It wasn't just a case of having sitting at the back of the bus. A.J. McClung told me. That he got on, that he was sitting on a bus one time in Columbus, just a little bit forward of what was the acceptable line, and a white guy smoking a cigarette walked by and inflicted cigarette ashes into his ear. Well, I found out later that this is not an uncommon occurrence. One way to show your displeasure without drawing attention to yourself is to do something like that. But there were many other ways a particular type of white person could uh, attempt to make a black person uh, feel. Uh, demeaned and, and inferior. Uh, so buses, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott proved to be very inflammatory. Uh, and uh, Columbus was, uh, uh, picked up some of that, there was the resonance over here from that. Uh, and when you couple that with the Supreme Court stuff, um, it got, the ball got rolling. And, and uh, people began to separate into camps very sharp divisions between uh, blacks and whites and also between whites, some of whom were liberal on the race issue, I mean liberal, that's moderate on the race <laughs> issue, and some of whom, the majority of whom were not. And so you had those divisions and I remember those 
in my own family. Uh, there were bad racists in my family too, and I grew up in a home, an old South family, and so I got the full brunt of all of that. I imagine that was a lot of families in the South where you had those conversations at dinner about, about race and the future of the South, and yeah. it could get pretty testy. <laughs> Barry, I, what was the name of the uh, white minister who was beaten to death in Selma? Um, um, anybody remember his name? I don't have it here uh, with me. I'm ashamed. I can't. Reeve, James Reeve. Yeah, Reed, yeah, James Reeve, Reed, Reed. yeah. I remember somebody bringing that up at our dinner table, and Grandmother said he got just what he deserved past the chicken police. And that stuck with me in my mind all my life. Yeah. I can hear her saying it right now. Yeah. So, uh, it was no fun here uh, in those days being black. Yeah. So what happens in 1956? The brewer is, is, is murdered by, um, is it Lucio Flowers? Lucio Flowers, yeah. And who is uh, Lucio Flowers? Lu Lu Lucio is what I've always heard okay. him called. I don't know that that's where. Yeah. Louis Cole, they like to call him. Louis Cole Flowers owned the um, M&R, M &B, or, or what is the name of that? f and Department Store downtown. He was, um, his brother Cecil was on the Public Safety Commission and uh, he was a rather well-known person. Um, not much money, uh, but a respected family and uh, his business uh, was in that area that I told you was um, on First Avenue that black people tended to congregate and, and his business primarily came from black people. He sold clothes and uh, um, cloth and shoes and one thing or another and uh, low priced, uh, aimed at uh, the black uh, or, or poor whites. Uh, I don't think he was very successful it, or either he, that or he had other problems with money habits I don't know anything about uh, but I know that he was uh, hard up for money uh, at the time uh, what happened was that um, uh, in uh, 1956 I forget the exact month but uh, he he saw a black person being arrested at um, it was in February actually he saw a black person uh, who happened to be named Sylvester Henderson uh, uh, being arrested by a, a white cop named Cannon. And um, a, he thought, Brewer thought, that um, the arresting officer, R.L. Cannon, used his nightstick uh, in a, a particularly brutal way and um, accused him of police uh, brutality and uh, and he was upstairs, Brewer was upstairs in his office which was right above the clothing store, uh, Lurko Flowers clothing store and he was looking down on this and he got a good view of the whole incident. So he goes downstairs after they put uh, uh, Henderson in the paddy wagon and he confronts Flowers and he says, look, you saw this incident just like I did. Um, I want you to go with me to the police station or to the public safety commission or to the county commission or whatever and let's file a, a police brutality complaint and um, he urged Louis Coe to do this. Well, Louis Coe said no. He had, he had in, in witnessed the incident but it was not a case of uh, police brutality that uh, Henderson was trying to bring his handcuffed hands down on the top of, of uh, Strowman Cannon's head, and it was at that point that Cannon began to use his nightstick. Well, Brewer insisted, and he would uh, go away and come back, and uh, it was almost like he was obsessed, and I think the incident really troubled Brewer. And he uh, urged Flowers, uh, and then began to go beyond urging, and he was, Brewer was good at that. Um, I'm sure he got right in Flowers' face eventually and said, you know, you damn well know what happened. Um, come with me. You're obligated to come with me. Your, your clientele is 90% black. You make your money off black people. Uh, you have an obligation to, when you see one of them mistreated, to uh, do what you can. I think he came back uh, four times before, three times at least, before 
uh, very formally in, in the end to see Brewer, see uh, flowers, Brewer did. And um, people knew that Brewer carried a small pistol in his pocket. Uh, we can't make too much of that. My daddy did too. All the physicians at that time who had to travel out in the country carried small pistols well, for protection. Um, and it, at any rate, he convinced the police that um, uh, Brewer was trying, uh, was threatening to kill him. And there are no witnesses to that, but uh, that's what Flower said, that he, he was threatening to shoot him if he did not go with him to file the police brutality complaint. Flowers continued to um, refuse on February the 18th. Uh, uh, I think Flowers contacted the police again, said that Brewer had been by, that he was coming back at 7 o'clock, and that he was threatening. Um, Flowers said he was threatening his life. Sure enough, on that evening about that time, 7, 7.30, Brewer shows up. And uh, we don't really know what happened in the store. We have various accounts of it. Uh, none of them accuse uh, Flowers of just whipping out his pistol and shooting Brewer. Uh, but they do confirm that after a, a brief argument and some separation between the two men, um, Flowers pulled out his pistol and shot Brewer seven times. Hit him four times in the chest, twice in the left arm, and I think in the head. Um, and uh, Brewer died. Um, the GBI came down, investigated the big deal in Columbus. John Land investigated, who was the Solicitor General at the time. Uh, but ultimately, um, no, uh, a, I think Land actually did file a charge of murder uh, against uh, Flowers, but it was no bill by the grand jury. It was ruled that he acted in self defense, that Flowers had acted in self defense. And Flowers never went to jail. They sent him to a psychiatric ward, I believe, in Cobb Memorial Hospital in Phoenix City, and he sort of wrote it out over there. Uh, and the, the community um, reacted, as you might imagine, along racial lines. The white people, many of them said good riddance and made no bones about it. The black community was prostrated. They were, they were crushed. Frank Chester told me that he broke down and cried, and uh, almost as much as he did when John Kennedy was shot. And uh, I heard others, A.J. McClung told me it was just that people couldn't believe it. Albert Thompson told me that. Um, and uh, so it, very, it was very frightening to black people. But one, re one reason was that Brewer had been the, the, not just the major leader uh, in civil rights in Columbus, he had been practically the only leader. And he was a dominant type of leader. He went around telling people what to do, not asking them what to do. Uh, and that was a very much a part of his personality. He had already decided what they were going to do, and he would come tell you what you were about to do. So some of the black people were glad to see him go, but the majority were um, deeply uh, grieved for him. And um, they began to react in a combination of, of uh, silent fear and fleeing. And quite a number of uh, members, uh, quite a number of the leaders in the black community, Dr. McCoo, for example, the attorney Abair, um, various other black lawyers and doctors and uh, business people fled. And so that community you were talking about downtown of, of business people uh, who formerly had served white clients as well as black barbers, for example, white people went to black barbers. Uh, they also disappeared, and it wasn't long after that that uh, most of those, not all, but most of those black businesses disappeared, and these black leaders fled. Dr. McCoo went to California. Bear went to, I think, Oakland, became uh, attorney for the port out there. Another lawyer, I've forgotten his name, ended up in Cleveland, where he became very prominent. These were, these were very capable, prominent people. And Albert Thompson, the lawyer who'd stayed, uh, in Columbus uh, said that it uh, stripped the city of uh, black civic leadership and it took years and years and years to rebuild it. Do you think that's why there wasn't as much, compared to other southern communities, why there wasn't as much civil rights activism in the early 60s? Or that, do you think there were other reasons behind it? I think that was the main reason, but I think it was one of the reasons. 
I think the other reason for us, black, blacks knew that the threats that came from whites in Columbus would be exercised. Yeah. They had done it in the past. They had, mm -hmm. they had killed, they had killed Brewer, the most prominent black person in Columbus. Yeah. And it, 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 a, a, a MacGuffin in the whole affair was that almost exactly one year later, Louis Coe Flowers was found dead in the lobby of a theater across the street from, um, right down the street from uh, Flowers' uh, clothing store, department store. Uh, and he had a handkerchief in his mouth and a 45 and a 25 pistol by his side. And um, he'd been shot with the 45. Um, there was, despite the rumors, there was very little evidence at the scene. Um, Lot, many rumors spread about that. It took on a mystic uh, power, still has it. Um, some people said immediately, uh, some white people said immediately, well, he was, he was uh, executed um, uh, mob style. And uh, people did think that maybe somebody from Chicago, uh, Brewer's wife, Thelma, fled to Chicago and took her. Uh, was her, that may not be her name. I've, it's been 30 years since I've thought of it. But her, his wife went to Chicago. Her daughter went. Her daughter's husband, who was a physician, they fled to Chicago. And people just said, well, uh, that's probably somebody the family has hired in Chicago. Some tough guys come down here and kill uh, flowers. And there were all sorts of rumors connected with a blood trail that supposedly led across the uh, county courthouse lawn, there was no blood trail, um, that he'd shot himself twice, shot himself once with the 45, uh, and, and just about everything else. The, the bullet holes in Flower's body, for example, I mean in Brewer's body, for example, was supposed to, you were supposed to cover them with a silver dollar. Well, you, I had autopsy pictures of it, and that's not true. He was shot four times, four times in the chest price up here and once in the head and the bullets were distributed as you would expect. So the white community clung to the notion and still does I think that uh, he that Flowers was killed by um, some sort of mobster from Chicago hired by the family. Um, What's your take on it? Do you have a... Opinion? I have a feeling that Louis Coe killed himself. Um, one reason is that he, the two pistol business, he was imitating the sheriff of Do down there in Dothan, Alabama, who, who had two pistols, who shot himself twice. Um, that was only a year or so before Louis Coe's. And, and I thought that was a remarkable coincidence. Uh, people said, well, you know, we knew, nobody shoots himself with two pistols. Well, as far as we can tell, he just shot himself with one pistol. But, mm -hmm. Uh, that just struck me as too much to be coincidence, that because mm -hmm. it got big coverage, the Dothan suicide got big coverage in the Columbus paper. So I suspect that um, that he killed himself, maybe financial. There may have been a relationship. Uh, I should say this between Brewer and and Flowers that that antedated by uh, by many years. Uh, they're coming to Columbus because they were from almost the same section of. I don't know whether the flowers from Saco, Alabama, but he was from down in that area. Uh, it could have been something personal that Brewer was angry about. Money occurred to me the first thing. Drugs occurred to me. Um, there were many th things Brewer could uh, flowers could have owed Brewer money because Brewer was you know made money and he lent money out and Brewer may have been trying to get flowers in addition to everything else to pay up. I mean all those things. Um, unfortunately have disappeared in the past. Uh, but they're all possible. And um, I guess the most prevalent rumor in the black community became that the police executed Brewer because you had the relationship between Flowers, his brother Cecil on the Public Safety Committee, which oversaw the police department and the fire department. You had all these cops that were in and, in and out of uh, the department store uh, for a week or more prior to that time. You had uh, one policeman when a Brewer was shot and killed across the street sitting in the car. You had uh, at least uh, one other in the department store and some people think there were two or three other in there. 
uh, and the the grouping in um, Brewer's chest of the shots, while it was not the size of a silver dollar or whatever, was rather concentrated, and uh, it, it showed. And Louisco was known to be a highly nervous person, as far as we know, minimal uh, use of of a weapon, especially the pistol. That uh, and it was relatively. I mean, when did he get that kind of expertise with pistol? Maybe he practiced. I don't know. Who knows? But uh, that pistol has disappeared. At least I don't know where it is. But we do have Brewer's pistol. It's in the collection at the Columbus Museum. Uh, so I think maybe flowers killed him. Um, I have a I have a uh, name of a policeman who was said to have been there who left Columbus and went to Alabama and uh, was born again, became a minister. And I have heard other policemen, including a former chief of police, say that he may have been involved in some way, but it, was, it all happened too long ago, and why talk about it now? Mm. Well, maybe that's a good question. Why, why, should, why, why is this important in the history of Columbus? Because Columbus has sedulously buried its racist past. And uh, even this incident, which was a major, major event in uh, civil rights, not just in Columbus, but in the nation, uh, has been forgotten here. I mean, it, it, it's astonishing. And after all, Brewer, people who saw the uh, Eyes on the Prize, the CBS documentary Eyes on the Prize, uh, or read the book, noticed that uh, Brewer's name was second on the list of people to, to, to whom that book was dedicated. People all over the United States and the world knew Brewer's name. This was a big, big deal. Uh, and um, if they can forget that, well, then it's not surprising that, you know, they forgot all the other lynchings that we trace back to 1854 here, and there were many before that, uh, and many we've missed. And um, I think I counted up, I don't know how many there were, whatever number I say would be wrong, but I'm thinking maybe 18 uh, lynchings in this area, uh, and many racial incidents, beatings, whatnot. Um, and white people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about slavery except in uh, this uh, insanely romantic way that, you know, anybody who knows the thing about slavery knows, geez, it's weird. It's a lot of things, but romantic wasn't one of them. Uh, and as I say, it goes back to the Indians. So there is a tradition here of, race, of, of apartheidism, of extreme racial prejudice, and uh, people just don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And they particularly don't want somebody who's a native son like me talking about it. Because well, they consider me a traitor and say so if they, they get the opportunity. Is that the kind of reaction, when, you're, when your three-part series came out about Brewer and, and, and the Ledger Inquirer, was that some of the reaction you got? Uh, mainly silence and indifference on the part of white people. Uh, some black people, um, particularly the black business community, noticed the series and read it and um, had a little program in my honor at, at the church. And uh, I don't know how many ordinary black people read it. I, I didn't hear anything from but um, I, I suspect they read it. Yeah. Uh, they either read that one or read the story of uh, the lynching of T.Z. Cotton. Mm -hmm. uh, they did read that story because a lot of, a lot of them seem to have known the Cotton family or the McElhaney family that was involved then they all knew the lands so um, it's difficult to tell how how much that stuff does any good yeah. I, I don't exaggerate the good that it does and uh, um, that can be discouraging yeah. sometimes yeah. Uh, but it just comes with the territory yeah um, I guess I'm out of questions. Do you want to add anything else that we didn't cover? Just that I'm glad you're here and I hope that uh, the, the kids who have an opportunity, the students who have an opportunity to actually learn something about 
uh, the racial history of America and of Georgia and, the, and Columbus in the Southeast will take advantage of that, will use it, and will go out in the world and apply what they've learned here um, and, and encourage others, particularly their family members, and when they get married and have children, they bring their children up to be tolerant of other people, races and religions and sexual orientation and all the rest, that they teach tolerance. So, I mean, since the days of Erasmus, you know, we've been, <laughs> we've had people try, preaching tolerance and uh, we need more tolerance. The whole country, I mean, you look, look at the Congress, I mean, it's a joke, it's become a joke. Uh, and, you know, it's not many steps from the Congress becoming a joke to the nation becoming a joke. So these, these bitter feelings have not left. There's still uh, prejudiced people among us who will stop at almost nothing to get their way. They often wrap themselves in uh, religious um, symbolism. Uh, it, and it, I mean, you, you, we're not going to eradicate it over, overnight and maybe it's something that we're never going to eradicate. I think Dr. King felt at the end there that there was, we were going to be doing this in, in you know, in 500 years from now. But uh, we are making progress. We have made progress in my lifetime. I just want to see it continue. You think Columbus is a, I mean, you grew up in Columbus, you've been around. You think it's more tolerant? I mean, has, it, has the progress been dramatic or has it just been this slow, steady, or? How would you describe the prog racial progress in Columbus? Well, you know, white people like to talk about how much progress there has been in racial matters. Black people, they don't talk about that. Um, most of the ones I know, you know, say, well, why do we always need to be having, making progress? Why can't we just get a situation in which we have equality across the board, a level playing field, and let's go on from there? Let's don't constantly be having to catch up, catch up, catch up, catch up. And I, I feel that there has been progress. Um, I know there's been progress in some areas in, in politics and in the, uh, and some in the courts, mm -hmm. to emphasize some, but um, I just think we got, we could, we've changed the law. Now we have to change people's hearts. And it's hard to change people's hearts because they can hide from you. So that's the way I feel about it. I really appreciate you coming in and sitting for this interview. It was great. You're more than Thank welcome. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you.